Welcome to this CTSNet interview with the giants of cardiac surgery. My name's Joel Dunning and I'm here at the STS in Houston. And there is no greater figure here than the president of the STS, Joe Bavaria. Thank you very much for coming to talk to us. Thank you, Joel. Uh, you've been a very active president this year and, uh, and your theme uh, has been very strongly of collaboration and innovation uh, at the heart of your term. Uh, this may be due to the fact that you actually were schooled in Paris uh, as your family moved around in Europe. Uh, and also, uh, when you did your degree in chemical engineering before medicine, uh, not only did you do this in New Orleans, but you went over to Edinburgh on an exchange programme. Uh, you did your residency in uh, the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and you're now the William Moore Meese Professor in Surgery and the Director of the Thoracic Aortic Surgery Programme at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. You're world-renowned for uh, complex aortic surgery, and you also have an international reputation uh, in cardiopulmonary transplant uh, and valve surgery. And you've not only written over 350 papers, but you've also written uh, guidelines in things such as aortic surgery and TAVA. You're co-PI of the International Registry of Acute Aortic Dissections, uh, and uh, PI of the Partner 1 and 2 trial, and uh, PI of Gortag, Valor and Zenith. Uh, I don't know how you have the time to do all this, but uh, it's very impressive. And thank you very much uh, for coming to see us. Thank you for inviting me, Joel. First, I was very interested uh, in those early days. How did you come to do a degree in chemical engineering and come across to medicine? And do you think it actually did help uh, with your future career? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think I went into chemical or into engineering originally um, with the idea that I might do uh, medicine uh, uh, with that. And that was actually the reason for choosing chemical engineering because it was a broad-based uh, science degree. Uh, as it turns out, uh, we think about it, chemical engineering is an incredibly broad-based science degree. Uh, so uh, that was one of the reasons why I chose it. I come from a family of engineers, however, and so it was, uh, it was always in the back of my mind that the po there was a possibility that I, that I would go into chemical engineering. Uh, and uh, I did go to Edinburgh, uh, Scotland. At, at that time, uh, the North Sea oil fields were ripping and roaring, and, and it was a great time to be a chemical engineer in, uh, in Scotland, in Edinburgh. <laughs> and, uh, and as you progressed in medicine, who were your main mentors? Who did you most look up to uh, in your past? Well, uh, the first uh, major mentor was uh, L. Henry Edmonds. Uh, L. Henry Edmonds, or Hank Edmonds, uh, was the chief of uh, cardiac surgery at Penn uh, for many years uh, during the 70s, 80s, uh, very early 90s. Uh, and he was one who got me uh, started uh, in this business. And he's also the editor of the Annals of Thoracic Surgery for 15 years. And then after that, uh, my main mentor was uh, Timothy Gardner, Tim Gardner, who was president of the ATS in 2002. Uh, and he um, was someone who really taught me how to be an academic cardiac surgeon and uh, really took me uh, from uh, when I was a ju very junior attending surgeon. So I have a lot, a lot to, uh, I owe them both of quite a bit. And, uh, and you run the uh, ERAD database on aortic dissections. You have a tremendous amount of experience with stenting. I just wonder if you could share with us your view of where are we going to be in 10 years' time with acute aortic dissection? We're already type B treating a lot. Will we go further? Will we get type A? Uh, yes. So uh, as you know and as you alluded to, type B dissection is, is at the point basically at this, at this stage where the primary treatment of choice is TVAR. There is a, a subset of patients in the chronic phase of type B dissection uh, where TVAR, there's a pretty, you know, there's a, there's a balance between open surgery and TVAR. And eventually it will go more towards uh, TVAR even uh, in, the, uh, in the chronic dissection uh, cohort for type Bs. In type A dissection, it's going to happen in two big stages. The first stage is going to be a primary open operation for type A dissection, mostly because the proximal operation, especially at the level of the valve, is required at this time. There's no endovascular solution that is good enough um, uh, at the valve and at the proximal ascending aorta. So, so the way I see it is we're going to have, uh, for the next 10 years anyway, uh, probably very, still very significant um, open surgery for the proximal aorta. However, uh, we know very well now uh, that the arch and the distal uh, aorta, the descending aorta, do not do well after type A dissection. In other words, the natural history of, it is, uh, of these aortas is unstable. So my opinion is, is that we're going to see a dramatic increase in the number of what we call completion TVARs. 
Um, they're either going to be done at the same time as the original index operation, for example, with one of the uh, stented elephant trunks uh, operations. Uh, there's a number of stented elephant trunk procedures out there. Or there'll be a short, uh, uh, what we call a sequential TVAR in type A dissection. So to the answer your question is, is uh, TVAR will be used a lot, especially coming up in the near future, for uh, completion type A dissection repairs to get a really good, solid uh, completion repair. As, as, as far as primary therapy for type A dissection, it's a decade away. Uh, and this means uh, TVAR of the ascending order directly down into the root. This is something that's being worked on a lot. It should be remembered that, uh, that uh, uh, 80 percent of all uh, uh, money, all capital uh, resources going into to TVAR today or is, is, is at the uh, proximal aortic surgical level by Cook and by, by Medtronic and by Gore and all the, all the industry. Wow, might save us from the middle of the night it dissection. Yes, and, uh, right. Wow. Um, in your presidency, you set three main goals. Uh, the goals were innovation and education, uh, collaboration and connection and quality, three very strong goals. And I wonder if we could spend a little bit of time on that, because you've actually advanced very significantly in all of those. Maybe if we could talk first about collaboration. Uh, I wonder if you could share with us the collaborations you've, uh, you've fostered, especially perhaps EACTs uh, across the Atlantic. Well, we certainly uh, have, uh, and I, this is one of my personal things, being, uh, having been you know, brought up in uh, Europe uh, as an American early on in my, in my life. But um, we have uh, a number of EACTS, uh, EACTS uh, collaborations. Um, the first one that we, was recent is uh, uh, having a collaboration in China. Uh, we recently um, had an EACTS uh, STS uh, collaboration with the Chinese Association. Uh, uh, in uh, Xi'an, China, and this will be continuing next year as well, or actually this year, uh, in, uh, in China, um, where we had uh, multiple members of, of the EACTS and the STS together uh, as a contingent uh, in China. Uh, we're uh, uh, having a large uh, South American uh, program. This is an STS EACS program uh, that we're uh, doing together uh, with the Latin Americans, especially Spanish speaking Latin America. Uh, and and it's the first one will be in September uh, in Cartagena, uh, uh, Colombia. So this is another uh, collaboration uh, with EX and also a collaboration with some of the South American local societies. So this is, uh, 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 and also at the EAC, EACTS level, at the database level, um, we're, we're uh, becoming more and more uh, collaborative at the database level as well as outcomes and things of that nature. Yeah, and something you're present to that's taken great strides is links with the AATS. Uh, I think there's collaboration, there's going to be collaboration with guidelines and many other things. Yes, it doesn't make any sense uh, for guidelines especially, which are being utilized by all the cardiothoracic surgeons in the entire world basically, to be uh, emanating out of only one society uh, and, or having competitive guidelines. It's, it's, it's really kind of semi-idiotic. So the AATS and the STS came together at, at the highest levels to make sure that this was not uh, part of our future. Uh, and this is a recent uh, a collaboration. And so all guidelines, especially at the very highest level of guideline formation, uh, and even maybe the secondary level of guidelines, uh, uh, in the United States anyway, will be done through the AATS and the STS uh, together. This will be a very significant advance for our, for our specialty. Yeah, no, that's absolutely wonderful. Um, the second part of your goals were, were innovation and education, and I think you've taken great strides towards e-learning and helping people to learn uh, electronically with the STS. Well, uh, so the STS absorbed the Joint Council uh, recently, and uh, we have a, you know, the, the goal is to be able to utilize the internet at its full capacity and the digital revolution in, its, in, in a full uh, manner. Uh, so we're wrapping around that completely as far as uh, learning uh, platforms for residents and, 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 uh, and, and at, the, at the very earliest level of, of cardiac surgical careers, as well as uh, uh, later on. Uh, and uh, so we have an e-learning platform, a curriculum, uh, we'll be uh, uh, developing thoracic and cardiac textbook content um, with uh, both uh, the written uh, word as well as uh, a video. Uh, and this will be all placed into an, into an e-learning environment uh, for the residents. Uh, and this will also be linked uh, to the American Board of Thoracic Surgery uh, and also uh, maybe other uh, credentialing boards across the world eventually. So uh, it's just a, an, an attempt to, to get uh, more, more, more deep into the, uh, into the learning environment uh, with the new digital age. 
and, uh, and the third goal was uh, advancing quality, and that was in fact the, uh, the subject of your presidential address, which was quality and innovation, and actually whether there is a collision between the two. And you gave a great talk about uh, the, the dual problems that we want patient safety, we want good reporting, but we don't want to, to harm the quality of surgery or, or restrict access. Um, I wonder if you could uh, share with us a little bit about your vision for the future of patient reporting in cardiac surgery. Well, un you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is that patient reporting and public reporting is going to be uh, uh, here to stay. This, uh, th there, there's no way we can go back on this. Patients and, uh, and countries and the state, and they all want this. So we're going to have to do it. We have to just do it wisely. We have to do it in a sophisticated manner. Uh, and we have to do it in a way that uh, does not allow uh, for a situation where uh, high-risk cases or cases uh, that um, uh, maybe uh, have a statistical outlier or, or end up not being done. You know, we have to have the courage to be able to do high-risk cases. So we have a little bit of a, a disconnect uh, between the concepts of, of, of very, very significant quality metrics and doing new things and doing uh, 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 new uh, innovation, uh, innovative kind of cardiac surgery or thoracic surgery, and also innovative uh, indications. So we have, we have a disconnect here and a, problem, and a possible collision, but we have to ma manage this because it's very important for our patients to get new, new technology, new techniques, new operations, but it's also very important for our patients to get um, uh, high quality surgery. So we have, you know, we have to, we, we, it's, it, it's complicated. We'll have to do, you know, we'll have to have a high sophisticated approach to it. Yeah, well, I really liked your idea of getting away from the concept of mortality and surgeon-based outcomes to patient-based outcomes. How do you think we can take that forward? Well, we must take that forward. So uh, this gets into the idea that, uh, especially at the one-year mark or so, that if we're doing a treatment uh, on a patient, no matter what it is, operation or whatever, and uh, the patient does not feel um, that they feel better, or the patient feels uh, that, they should, that they wouldn't have had the operation if they could go back uh, and make that decision again, then that's not appropriate. So this is a patient-centered or a patient uh, uh, outcome uh, measure. And I think we're going more and more towards that. We're just starting very, very early on right now of, of being able to have a metric that we can put in at, say, the one-year mark uh, and put it into our, into our database and saying, hey, let's take a look at this. And it's happening at the TVT database, uh, the STS National Database. Uh, usually they're related to quality of life met, uh, metrics at this point. What we don't want to do is say something like, you know, the surgeon says, well, you know, you didn't die and you didn't have a stroke, so we're happy. Well, the patient may not be happy with the whole operation. So we have to have, you know, we have to have a balance between the way we report these things. The patient-centered patient, patient -centered metrics are, are, their time has come. Yeah. So maybe taking a step back, if, if somebody came to you and asked about uh, some career advice, perhaps a son of yours or something, and said, you know, you know, how was your career and what would you recommend for young and up-and-coming people? Is it a good career? Oh, yeah. I think uh, cardio, cardiothoracic surgery uh, has an outstanding future, um, and there's a lot of reasons to, to believe that that's the, tr the, the case. Now, I don't know, I'm not a thoracic surgeon, so I can discuss uh, the cardiac side. There's a uh, I usually tell uh, young surgeons that there's a number of different areas that are just booming uh, and that are the future. Uh, minimally invasive surgery of any, of any type, uh, uh, valvular reparative surgery of any type. Everybody will always choose to keep their own valve uh, rather than have a new valve no matter how you put it in. So reparative valve surgery is, is very, very important. Uh, transcatheter or endovascular surgery, especially of the valves and of the aorta, uh, is, uh, uh, is, is booming. Uh, it's, uh, it's an exciting revolution that's happening and we're, we're kind of in the middle of it. Uh, and uh, so I think all these areas are, are very, very important. And frankly, one of the most important ones that's uh, very exciting and, and is something I tell young surgeons as well is the, is the treatment of heart failure. Um, and uh, we have new uh, circulatory assist devices, we have new left ventricular assist devices, uh, and uh, these are getting better and better. The trials are, are astonishing. Uh, and I see a future uh, of, of, of really excellence in, in our treatment of, of congestive heart failure uh, surgically. Great. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Just finally, Kate, your perfusionist, tells me that uh, the best way to do a circulator arrest, uh, distal anastomosis, is with rock music. Uh, so, so which track is best for doing that uh, circulatory arrest part? I, I personally like Aerosmith. <laughs> uh, Aerosmith is great. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Thank you very much for coming to talk to us, and thank you very much for your outstanding presidency this year. Thank you to CTSnet. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs>